Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Saturius Johnson. Did you know that California grows one-third of the vegetables and two-thirds of the fruits and nuts in the entire nation? Or that the Golden State produces more than 99% of the country's fresh grapes? To help celebrate California's massive and incredibly important agricultural industry, October has been designated California Farmer and Farmworker Month. We're headed to the Central Valley to meet fourth-generation peach farmer Nikiko Masumoto. I hope that we think about ourselves in long-term relationships with farm workers. There's a lot of invisibility in the food system that kind of separates us, but we really are all collectively linked. We'll also talk to Valia Frome, who turns grapes into wine on California's central coast, and we'll meet fourth-generation almond farmer Steve Schaefer. When the orchards are in bloom, the whole valley floor turns white. The trees just look like cotton balls. And then after that, the petals start to fall and the ground turns white. It looks almost like snowfall. That's all coming up on California Now. Californians who love peaches know that the Masumoto family farm is an institution. The family has been feeding people for generations growing organic peaches, nectarines, and apricots, as well as grapes for raisins on 80 acres south of Fresno. Here to tell us more about both the farm's produce and its remarkable history is fourth-generation farmer and author Nikiko Masumoto. Welcome to California Now, Nikiko. Thanks so much, Satirius. It's great to be with you. So to start out, the food you grow shows up all over California. It's on the menu in fancy restaurants. People put it in ice cream, even craft beer. Could you share a few favorite places where we can find your product? We are so fortunate to be part of a network of people and professionals who really value flavor. So you can find our fruit in the Bay Area at a number of retail places, Good Eggs, Buy Right, Berkeley Bowl. And then in terms of restaurants, we work with Water Bar on the Embarcadero. Um, In Southern California, Nicole Rucker just launched an amazing pie bakery. And so we're we're just super lucky. That is so amazing. I I have to say, eating extremely fresh produce is one of my absolute favorite things to do. And peaches, oh my God, a fresh peach is just heaven. Why does fruit taste so much better when it's ultra fresh? You know, when I think about eating, Satirius, like you, I I just love the actual embodied experience. And there's something about eating food, especially produce, closer to where it's harvested, that the the flavors get to retain their authentic power. And so I think the closer you can get to the source, the better the flavor is going to be. You know, I wanted to hear a little bit about the history of Masumoto Farms. Um, I gather it's it's a powerful story. How did it come to be? Yes, there there's not a day that goes by where I don't deeply think about my ancestors. Um, there's something very spiritual about getting to touch the same soil that your great-grandparents literally worked in. So in the case of our farm, my great-grandparents immigrated from Japan at the turn of the century. And like many Asian immigrants at that time, they could not own land in California. It's part of the dark history of California agriculture that certain groups were actually excluded from having the California dream. And that was the case of my family. So my great grandparents, they spent their whole lives working the fields as farm workers with with a lot of deep knowledge about the land, but not the same rights as other people around them. So I think about them when I get to pick a peach, when I get to harvest a bunch of of grapes. Um, And I think about the gift of their work in the soil and the, the gift of the delight of fruit. I mean, farming is all about growing food to nourish our bodies. And so that immigrant story is, is always part of who I am as a farmer. And your family was also affected by when the U.S. entered World War II. Your family was also affected by the rounding up of Japanese Americans and moving them inland and putting them in camp. Is that right? All of my family, my great grandparents and my grandparents were imprisoned during World War II. Um, and it was after being released from camp that my grandfather, my Jichan, he bought the first 40 acres of our farm. And I, I often think about that moment. He was in his 20s after World War II. 
and my family had lost everything because we were literally ripped away from our homes. And instead of letting that experience fester into bitterness, my Jichan decided to plant roots again and to, in a sense, defiantly believe that our family had a place in California. That's pretty powerful. I mean, for to, to go from being a prisoner in your own country to then being able to bounce back like that, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. It is. And, and, and I don't think it's a story that's without sadness, like very deep sadness. Um, and in contrast to that, at the same time as there's so much heaviness in the history of my family, there's just incredible, I, I sometimes think about defiant joy. Mm. My, my Jichan, he ate peaches, whether it was fresh peaches during our harvest season or peach preserves. He ate peaches every single morning for breakfast. <laughs> and I think that was his little celebration that he had made a place for himself. Right. What was it about California, do you think, uh, that brought your family back here? Because a lot of people ended up going to other places of the country. Yes, yes. After camp, um, Japanese Americans were faced with the question of where do we go now? How do we rebuild our lives? Um, and in the case of my family, Farming is what my family knew. It was the, the work that they knew. And the Central Valley of California is, was where our, our family was before the war. And so it, it was kind of, I think, a, a question of what is the most familiar place that I can try to return to and heal from this trauma, um, the place I want to heal in. And so my, my family came back. Is that something that you think about often? I mean, the significance of of carrying your family's legacy forward after so many decades? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think about my own individual story as, as a young kid, a farm kid. I never wanted to come back to the Central <laughs> Valley. I never imagined myself farming. Um, and yet here I am. And, and I think about the kind of calling uh, back to the land. Al almost with foolish <laughs> courage do we return to the land. Um, and I think it's because there's something so nourishing about making home in California and then offering back to our neighbors this bounty of the land. And it, it's almost an irresistible romance, right? Um, but it comes with at, at a great cost of extreme amount of sweat, that's for sure. <laughs> well, we're all happy you're doing it because the peaches are absolutely amazing. And, um, and you say foolish courage, I think, because it's a lot of hard work. I mean, being able to tend to these uh, peach orchards, is that what they're called? Orchards? Yes, yes. Yeah, so to, to, to tend to the trees and to, to produce, you know, this uh, amazingly delicious and juicy fruit, all of the, the fruit that you produce, um, it doesn't come easy, but it's so worth it. You're absolutely right. It's, it's physically grueling. It's mentally challenging. Um, and we are facing some of the biggest challenges of our time in farming. And so um, it, it, it is, I say, the most meaningful path I could imagine for myself. Let's turn now to the to the visitor experience. There are there are, uh, a few ways people can actually sort of experience your farm. So why don't we start with the drive through? What can I expect if I come to do a drive through through your farm? A couple of years ago, we launched this drive through program partially out of my frustration because we had these amazing tasting stone fruit that just couldn't find um, the right place because they might have had like a cosmetic defect or something. So it started out of my love for what I call ugly fruit. <laughs> um, but now we have expanded. So we offer all of our all of our fruit through the drive through. So when people sign up for the drive through, um, we send them emails when the fruit is ready. And then you order and then you literally drive up to my house, which is the house my grandparents built. And there is at least one Masumoto working every single drive through. And we welcome you and literally we check you in and put your box wherever you want in your car and you get to drive away with this hopefully aromatic box of peaches, nectarines, or apricots. Um, and then we hope um, that the, the aroma transfers into an awesome first bite. 
So what kinds of people do you tend to see visiting the farm, like coming on the drive through We are so amazed. There is a wide group of people who come to the drive through geographically speaking. We intended it to be a local program, but people have been driving every single drive through from Northern California, Southern California. And the people who come often are coming because they've maybe heard about the peaches or nectarines we grow. And when they come, many of them start returning. And when they return, we start to get to know them by name. And so this is our seventh summer doing our drive through this year. And now complete strangers who came in search of a peach are feel like old friends. And so, so much so that at our last drive through of the season, many, several people who we only know through the drive through when they came up to pick up their last box, they said, we're really going to miss you. And we felt the same way. And so it's just this like incredible connection via food. Yeah. I mean, people coming year after year after year. And it's, and it's not like you just do like one drive through per season, like you're doing them on a regular basis, right? Yeah. This summer we modified a little bit. So we had a drive through twice a week, every week from the beginning of our season in May through the end in early August. That's really great. So you have a lot of opportunities to kind of, you know, come at the beginning of the season, maybe at the end of the season for the harvest. So uh, really a lot of a, a lot of really great ways to experience the farm. It, it's incredible. And I think it speaks to um, it, it reassures me that we're doing something right if people are willing to come back year after year. Um, and it, it reminds me a lot of one of our other programs, uh, our adopt a tree program. Um, people, teams gather themselves and apply to adopt one or both of two heirloom varieties, Alberta peach or Le Grand Nectarine. And then when this time is right, they come and harvest their own tree. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. So you almost have like this relationship with an actual tree. Do you get to like watch it? Do you like give people updates throughout the year? Like this is what your tree's doing? Yes, exactly. We give updates about the season and and what we're struggling with, things that we're seeing in the, in the fields. And so in that program, we've done it for over 15 years. And I would guess about two thirds of the teams have been coming for seven or more years. That's really great. Of course, October is the first ever California Farm and Farm Worker Month. Why do you think it's important to celebrate the people who grow America's food? I think especially this year, when there has been so much uncertainty, it's really important to think about what are the core elements of a nourished life, a life that is full of support and health and well-being. And farmers and farm workers absolutely are at the core of that. We can't live without food, and food has the power to not only nurture our bodies, but to connect us with cultural identities, connect us through family, through friendships. Um, And really for me, the food and the act of eating together, that's what kind of keeps me going on a day-to-day basis, even when times are kind of dark. And, you know, farm workers are truly essential workers. Like we could not survive as a society without our farm workers. So it really is great to be able to recognize and acknowledge um, all of the work that they do for everyone. Absolutely. And I, I hope that eaters all across the United States and the world, I hope that we think about ourselves in long term relationships with farm workers. There's a lot of invisibility in the food system that kind of separates us, but we really are all collectively linked. And I feel like if we thought about ourselves as always eating, always at our table, there's a farm worker at our table, um, I think that would lead us to treat our farm workers even better. That's a really nice way of thinking of it. So before you go, I'm told that you spend a fair amount of time on a tractor listening to podcasts. I'm guessing a lot of our listeners have never sat on a tractor. So what's something about sitting on a tractor that might surprise them? It's very true. Podcasting is my best friend on the tractor. <laughs> um, and the thing about the tractor that is, is pretty incredible for my creative process, there's something about the work 
it involves your body and you're surrounded by almost an audience of trees or vines and there's insects everywhere and the sun is out and the sky is usually clear. And for me, listening to a podcast is a way of inviting my imagination to just thrive. And so I'm doing something productive and tending to the earth, but I still get to have a, a adventure of my mind. And so that's, I just, I, I love podcasts. I, all of my favorite ones, I know exactly what day they're uploaded. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And I, wait a minute, I hear, I hear that, that a tractor actually featured a prominent role on your wedding day. What's that about? It's true. This was the <laughs> only thing that I like absolutely wanted at my wedding. <laughs> my wife and I got married just last year here on our farm. And after the ceremony, we drove up to our reception on our my favorite tractor. And oh it my was God. one of the best moments of my life. That's hilarious. Did you have like cans or something dragging b- behind the tractor or anything like that? My best friends decorated. Imagine like a big orange tractor <laughs> with purple streamers everywhere. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds amazing. That's really great. My God, Nikiko, this has been really fun. Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. Thank you, Satirius. It's so great to share this time with you. Nikiko Masumoto is a fourth-generation farmer at Masumoto Family Farm. You can find them online at masumoto.com or on Instagram at masumoto underscore family underscore farm. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. When you're sipping a sublime Syrah or Pinot Noir in a fancy restaurant or perhaps in a stylish tasting room, it can be easy to forget that what you're enjoying is grape juice from grapes that grew on a vine on a farm, a farm that was carefully cultivated and harvested by farmers and farm workers. My next guest is Valia Frome, a winemaker who spends a ton of time in the fields. She's the founder and owner of Desperado Wines in Paso Robles, about halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco, along California's central coast. Welcome to California Now, Valia. Thanks. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. To start out, can you give us a quick description of Desperado Wines? Where is it and what is it? So uh, we are a small winery, um, as you said, in Paso Robles. We're actually located in the Tin City area of uh, Paso, uh, a kind of growing and uh, robust and dynamic area with a bunch of little wineries and a brewery, a distillery. It's it's a really cool little neighborhood, uh, but it's definitely urban winemaking. Um, we started in 2009 and moved into this neighborhood in 2014 and have just kind of uh, grown and developed our focus on Bordeaux varietals and Italian varietals. We use a lot of clay amphora that we import from Italy, and we we really focus on experimentation and trying new things and honing things in in the vineyard and then, um, you know, bringing that into the cellar. And we do about 3,200 cases on any given year and spread amongst probably 15 different wines at any given time. So a lot of a lot of really fun stuff that we do in the cellar. I really love the name Desperada. Uh, how did you pick it and what does it mean to you? Desperada is, well, it's the feminine version of a Desperado, right? But right. it's like this outlier, or this like outlaw, someone that kind of marches to their own beat. And I, I think that's, you know, that's originally how the name came to be. And it just felt right. You know, it's um, the brand and the wine. And myself, I think are, there's a lot of femininity there, but there's a lot of tomboy masculinity. And um, I think the brand and the wines reflect that. Yeah, we're actually catching you in the middle of a harvest uh, right now as we speak. Can you describe a typical day for you uh, right now, if such a thing even exists? Yeah, that's it doesn't really exist. Everything is very dynamic day to day right now. So uh, right now I'm staring down into the cellar. We're on our third press load of Sauvignon Blanc from the day. We brought in our first uh, fruit for the day at around 6 a.m. and started pressing that. And we're filling up barrels and we're filling up amphora. And let's see, yesterday I did a big vineyard loop. So at least once a week, sometimes twice right now, I get in the car and I start my morning in San Luis Obispo and I loop around and check all the vineyards and see where we're at for harvesting for the week and to see how all the fruit looks, to talk to the growers, 
So yesterday I started at six in the morning and was, you know, spent all day out there. I was in two counties, uh, six cities, four AVAs, checked eight vineyards and 13 different varietals. And then I was at the winery by three o'clock. So that was that day. But yeah, every day right now is, is just really different, which makes it really fun. Like we wait all year for harvest because it's really exciting. Right, right, right. Uh, on your website, you're listed as Desperado's winemaker and owner. What all goes into that? I mean, it sounds like a pretty all-encompassing role. Being owner means that I sometimes clean the toilets before the tasting room opens on Thursday. It means that I, you know, meet with my bookkeeper every week to make sure bills are getting paid and people are getting paid. It means I do compliance and paperwork and have hundreds of emails and then we go on the road usually and do sales trips. But this year being so different, it means we're doing a lot of phone calls and Zoom calls and, you know, being in touch with our distributors and the people that sell our wine, you know, bottling season and, uh, you know, all the things that have to happen in the cellar. So blending and getting ready for bottling, label design, you know, I have an amazing creative team of, of two that make sure that all of our labels are done and our collateral and our branding and just make sure everything looks cool. So it's just managing all of that. So I'd really like to hear about how you got into this business. I understand you started out in restaurants and then wine sales, and then you found that you really liked getting your hands dirty. Yeah, that uh, that is exactly it. So I started off in uh, some fine dining restaurants and got I was lucky enough to work with a really great psalm and work with some really high-end chefs. And I just caught this wine and food bug really early. And loved that lifestyle and loved the experience with things that I had, I wasn't raised with fine wine and fancy food. So to me, that was uh, just a whole new world that was kind of opening up. So I was always on that kind of sales side of it. Um, and I, I really wanted to do something a little bit more visceral and to take uh, a more hands-on approach. I'd always wanted to try production. So I moved here to Paso Robles in 07 and I bought an old trailer and moved it onto a vineyard and I had this crazy dog <laughs> And I got a job as a cellar rat in a big co-op facility. Wait a minute. What's a cellar rat? Uh, good question. So a <laughs> cellar rat is like literally a little, like imagine a little cellar, in the, like a little rat in the cellar. So <laughs> it's like your lowest, lowest paid intern kind of position that does all of the really crappy grunt work. So it's a really important job, but it's definitely the, the, the lowest on the totem pole. So digging out tanks, uh, dragging hoses, cleaning, it's like literally the wine industry is, you know, on the seller side anyways, it's probably 70% cleaning anyways, mm. but most of that is done by your cellar rat. So, um, but it was a great experience because uh, I worked a lot of really long days and I got really, really tired. And then from there uh, at that same co-op facility, I started off with my own uh, four barrels in 2009. And then that just kind of grew into this. So, so let's turn now to the visitor experience. Um, for someone who's not familiar with Tin City and Paso Robles, would you sort of set the stage for us to kind of describe it? So my landlord, Mike English, he's he's a visionary. He's a really, really cool cat. And he, you know, had a bunch of different businesses here. And then just serendipitously and through different connections, one winery came and then another winery came. And they, uh, you know, he saw this need for people like myself that don't have a lot of capital, but have a very successful brand and then don't want to be in a big co-op facility. He started putting up tin buildings and started putting in drains and chillers because that's, again, all you need to make wine. And and he really just wanted to see this area grow. And so there was a brewery here in the beginning and maybe three or four wineries. And now we have we have a cider house, a creamery, an olive oil shop, a brewery, a distillery, a high-end restaurant, a low-end restaurant, food trucks, 25 different wineries and tasting rooms. It's a one-stop shop. Um, there's always live music at the barrel house every weekend. Um, you know, there's ice cream for the kids. Like it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's like, you could just come and spend the day and there's, yeah. And it's, you know, literally one minute, maybe not even a full mile off the highway. So, but you'd never know it was here until you knew. So let me ask you this. Um, if I, if I were sitting down right now for a wine tasting, can you kind of describe to me, like you're pouring me a glass, you're going to, I'm going to let you choose the bottle, right? And just describe to me like what I'm going to be tasting, just so I can get a sense of what uh, one of your wines is like. Yeah. So I'm actually going to be pouring for you today a bottle of a 2019 uh, Wayfinder Chardonnay. Um, half of our production here at Desperata is white. Uh, and out of that production, uh, 90% of that is Sauvignon Blanc. 
But the other 10%, I, I reserve for kind of an experimental white every year. I, I switch it up. But then I always do a little bit of Chardonnay. And I never meant to be a Chardonnay producer, but I absolutely adore working with the Chardonnay from Bienecito Vineyard. It's an amazing vineyard owned by the Miller family. Um, and it's farmed by a man named Chris Hamill, who is like a farmer ninja. He's amazing. He's been farming that vineyard for, I think, almost 20 years. And this little lot of Chardonnay is, uh, it's Clone 5, its own rooted Chardonnay that was planted in 1973. And it is absolutely stunning every year I only get a couple tons um, but you will notice when you drink it that it is like the most perfectly balanced and it comes in like that it's textbook perfect the numbers are perfect the bricks the pH the TA and from there all I have to do is not screw it up and I put it into brand new French oak every year because it can handle it because it's so well balanced every other way and it's got just beautiful acidity and that oak just really adds a lot of richness and roundness. So it's very different than all the other whites that we do in house, but it's always one of my like very decadent, hmm. most pleasurable favorites. Somehow I'm, I've started salivating. I'm, I don't know what's happening, but I, I'm getting very thirsty all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> what would you say is your favorite thing about, you know, owning and operating a winery in, on the central coast of California? The people I get to work with, mm -hmm. for sure. For that, whether that's growers, whether that's you know, we have an amazing staff. My husband owns a winery as well, and between the two of us, we have about fourteen employees, and um, that's everything. They're the coolest. Some of them have been with us for over a decade, and it's it's family. And so to watch them develop and grow, and watch our family grow, and watch their family grow, and see people growing and achieving their dreams and going on to do other things. And, um, you know, the growers that we get to work with and seeing, you know, just watching people, people's development is by far the richest part of all of this. Well, Velia, this has been so great. Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Velia Frome is the owner of Desperada Wines in Paso Robles. They're online at desperada.com. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. When you consider the concept of essential workers, your mind might race to healthcare professionals, law enforcement, and those in the transportation field. Well, don't forget about the farmers and farm workers who grow the food you eat. That's truly essential work. Steve Schaefer is a fourth generation farmer who knows about growing nearly everything you'd need for a nice picnic, including figs, grapes, and that California staple, almonds. Located not far from Fresno, Steve's here to tell us more about his many-faceted operation. Did I mention he was also voted Wine Grower of the Year in 2018 by the California Association of Wine Grape Growers? Welcome to California Now, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So, you know, I know uh, you grow a wide variety of produce on your property. Can you give us kind of like the, the Reader's Digest version of your operation? Uh, yeah, I, I started farming in partnership with my brother and my father uh, when I got out of college in 1979. At the time, we were we were growing almonds, raisin grapes, and uh, and wine grapes. I'm a fourth generation grape grower. My my great grandfather came over here in about 1906 and uh, and started farming grapes uh, as a farm laborer, basically. And uh, eventually saved enough money to um, buy a small plot of land and start growing a vineyard on it. My grandfather then followed in his footsteps, and my father then, and then uh, my brother and I. So that's that's what brings us here today. I kind of live near uh, an almond orchard, and it's quite an incredible sight. It's like the trees are kind of all lined up very neatly, and they're you know they're very beautiful. And when they bloom, they're just incredibly beautiful. Uh, when orchards when the orchards are in bloom, the whole valley floor turns white. Um, we've got about a good two weeks of bloom that 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 the trees just look like cotton balls out there, and uh, and then after that the petals start to fall and the ground turns white. It looks almost like snowfall, and uh, and it's a beautiful sight. And and folks that get married at that time of year inevitably will go out and take a picture in an almond orchard at petal fall and the the white background with the brown trees in the back, we, you know, against it, um, you know, is, uh, is pretty gorgeous backdrop. Yeah, it's beautiful.
a lot of people tend to think of um, almonds as nuts, but actually, botanically, they're they're actually seeds from fruit, right? Yeah, they're. I mean, they're they're the uh, familial equivalent of a peach pit, you know, and they come from the same uh, the same strain uh, genus of trees, but uh, they're uh, they're a very popular commodity. When I when I first when we first got involved with uh, almonds in the late sixties. I think the marketplace was producing uh, about 50 million pounds. And this year, there's the potential for us to um, pass 3 billion pounds as an overall statewide crop. So, That's great. And uh, what do you think is, is the key to being a successful almond farmer? Well, I'm going to say the key was, is start out being a grape farmer, and then um, <laughs> you find out how easy it is to be an almond grower. <laughs> <laughs> Are, are grapes that much more challenging? Um, uh, grapes are, are considerably more uh, labor-intensive now that we're mechanized, I, I, I could say that. And that's a big joke around here because uh, probably a majority of the growers here that grow almonds used to grow grapes or still do grow grapes. And so, uh, you know, the joke is around here is if you're not a very good grape farmer, you'd probably be a great almond farmer, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it's it's like uh, it's like being a shepherd. I mean, it's the same. I mean, agriculture is that way for almost every commodity. You you just you gotta you gotta put a shadow on the ground every day, and uh, and I think that's probably the number one criteria. You don't you you know you can't plan to take a week's vacation at pretty much any time of the year because you don't know. Uh, if something's going to come up that you have to deal with. So, uh, and I think that that goes for anyone that, that has the word farmer behind their name. So, you know, we're catching you during harvest, uh, right now. What's something you especially enjoy about harvest? You know, I, when I was younger, I used to enjoy it a lot. As I get older, it's less and less enjoyment because I'm just not up to the amount of work it takes. But I mean, uh, harvest kind of is the culmination of everything you've been doing all year long. You know, farmers basically work all year long and hopefully get paid at the end of the year. Um, and uh, and that's this is the payoff. So you're you're seeing the, the so-called fruits of your labor. Right. Right. Now. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit about San Joaquin Wine Company. Well, San Joaquin Wine Company is, um, you know, is something that uh, my wife and I started back in 2005. And uh, it was a situation where I kind of had had always uh kind of rolled this this dream around in my head and uh you know it's one of those things that you know i uh lucky for me i didn't know as much about it then <laughs> as i do now because if i did i might have changed my mind uh but it's been it's been an exciting ride uh you know, uh, the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the street, but <laughs> so, you got to go there to find out. Right, exactly. You know? So so wait, so you were growing grapes, and so then what prompted the decision to start your own winery? You know, I like I said, I was for two years I was chairman of the California Wine Growers Association, and I saw a lot of my uh, colleagues uh, in, the, in the organization that were starting up, uh, you know, small wineries, sometimes large wineries, and... Uh, and uh, it just appealed to me as as a as a way to to get closer to the consumer, uh, you know, kind of break down that barrier that was separating me from from the from the end user. And uh, and and we accomplished that. Uh, it's it's been a lot of a lot of work, but uh, uh, you know, it's a very competitive business, and uh, uh, you know. You, you're never going to, you know, you always think it's something that's going to be just great and no, no, no hassles at all. What it really did was cause me to have to basically go to school again and learn a whole nother trade, basically, to uh, be able to handle. It. What's one thing about California's farms and farm workers that a lot of people don't realize? Well, I think one thing that that a lot of people don't realize is that um you know the farm workers we have here; uh, they work hard, and and they're a benefit to to this country by being here. And uh, I don't I don't have people working for me that that commit crimes. I mean, they get up every morning and they go to work. 
and uh, we have we have employees you know most i mean almost all of them are hispanic but i have employees i we had one guy work for us started working for us when i was a little kid he worked for our family for 50 years amazing and uh, we've got a lot of people who have worked for us for 25 and 30. so uh those those people i mean the state of california especially if you were to if you were to send everybody home, I think the state of California would shut down. And certainly agriculture would. Mm -hmm, Probably mm -hmm. the hotel and restaurant industry would go right well, with Well, that's why farm workers are essential workers, right? I mean, they are truly essential, helping to feed the nation. No, they, they, definitely, they definitely are essential. There's no doubt about that. Well, Steve, this has been so great. Thanks so much for joining us on California Now. Um, thank you. I enjoyed the, uh, I enjoyed our talk and, uh, I look forward to you coming down here sometime and seeing what we have here. Absolutely. You're on my list. <laughs> Steve right. Schaefer is a fourth generation farmer, a renowned wine grower in Madeira. You can find out more about San Joaquin Wine Company at sjwineco.com. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. We hope you enjoyed this episode on California Farmer and Farm Worker Month and get a chance soon to enjoy some of the tasty food Californians grow. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find our show on iTunes and Stitcher. Please subscribe. And you can learn more about California and plan your next visit at visitcalifornia.com slash podcast.